have a good crowd this week. It seems our numbers are increasing each week, and we're thankful for that. I want to continue our thoughts from our lesson last week is I may or may not have gotten a little carried away in, in that lesson. I hope that it was beneficial for you. But I began the lesson by speaking about a job that may have been offered to you that offered you more money than you would ever have made in your life. The only problem was there was no definition of what your responsibilities would be, who your boss would be, and I asked you the question, would you accept such a job? And then what we see as we look here in our passage, when we appoint leaders in the church, and we, have, we try to appoint folks to take care of the work that's been assigned, oftentimes we in the church are guilty of just doing exactly that. And we need to understand and we need to learn that it is not really important what pleases man. But in the leadership of the church, it is always important about what pleases our God whom we serve. And so looking at our passage this morning, very briefly, I want to look back and remind you those who were in attendance, and to those of you who were not with us last week, it would be unfair to you if I did not at least cover the first few points of this lesson. We first of all looked and we saw that the situation had arisen among the early church. And I went back this week and again I looked at about 28 different translations of this verse that go all the way back from the original 1611 King James, which is much different than what King James you have in front of you today, all the way through the one of the most current versions, the English Standard Version. And I want you to know as I talked about this situation that arose, what I want to point out to you and how it compares to our world today, it was pitting one group of people against another group of people. Perhaps the best translation that I read said it was the Greek-speaking Christians versus the Hebrew-speaking Christians. And so the, the, the situation was these Greek-speaking Christians were saying our widows are being neglected. And let me define that a little further. They were saying our Greek widows are not being treated the same as the Hebrew widows are being treated. And so that was the situation. And so as you continue looking in Acts chapter 6, you will see that the apostles came up with the solution. And the solution was, from the words of the apostles, that we cannot leave the ministering of the word and the prayer that we need to be praying. So they said to those individuals, look out among yourselves and select seven men. I call them the magnificent seven. And so the solution was for those men to take care so that the apostles could focus on what God wanted them to do. I do quickly want to call your attention again back to the Bible where it says that these three men, or these seven men, were given three qualifications. The apostles said these are the type of men that you need to look for. Number one, they must be of a good reputation. In other words, they needed to be ones who could be trustworthy in carrying out the work that the apostles had laid forth. But secondly, it says that they needed to be full of the Holy Spirit. 
And brethren, when I think of that term full of the Holy Spirit, I realize that those men probably had the hands of the apostles laid upon them. I understand that. But not only did they need to be men of good reputation, but being full of the Holy Spirit, they needed to have an understanding not only of what the apostles and the people expected, but based on their knowledge of God's Word, they needed to know what God expected. And then the third qualification says that they were full of wisdom. Oftentimes, men are appointed without wisdom. And wisdom is simply the ability to apply the knowledge that you have and to apply it in the best way possible. Those were the qualifications for these three men, for these seven men. And so the apostles saw the situation as it was brought to them. They offered a solution and noticed that the solution involved the church. It wasn't a select group of individuals. It was the church as a whole. So let's now move forward to point number three of our lesson. We see in verse 5 and verse 6 a selection. And I want to call, first of all, to your attention in verse 5 where it says, And the same pleased the whole multitude. What the apostles' solution was pleased the whole multitude. Here it is. Now, let's look at the church today. And then let's look at the world. Because I think they go hand in hand. How often do we see where there is always a certain number of members of the congregation or members of society who are never pleased with the selection of leadership. Are you saying there are disgruntled members within the congregation or within the church as a whole? Absolutely, that's what I'm saying. And the reason we become disgruntled is because we ourselves, as individuals, Maybe we haven't filled our own life with the Holy Spirit. And when I think about filling our life with the Holy Spirit, I'm referring to the knowledge we gain through the written Word. We oftentimes would rather take the Word of someone who is more educated, quote unquote, than we are. Amen. I'm going to pick on Chip this morning. Is that okay, Chip? But it doesn't matter if it's okay or not, I still want to do it. <laughs> I think many of you would agree with me that our brother Chip is one of the smartest and most knowledgeable men when it comes to Scripture. Would you agree with that? Yes or no? Yes. I know a lot. How did I learn? How did Chip learn? We simply learn by study and application. Now, are there times when Chip and I disagree with each other? Yes. Is that okay that we disagree? Chip says yes. But the bottom line is when we disagree, what do we need to do? We need to dig deeper into the Word to become more filled with the Holy Spirit that we might have a better understanding. And this is what I see in this passage. The whole congregation agreed because they understood not the small picture that was in front of them, but they understood the bigger picture that was laid out by the apostles and by their knowledge of God's Word. So when we see that it pleased the multitude, then keep going. It says, and then they chose Stephen. A man full of faith and the Holy Spirit, and Philip, and Prochorus, and Nicanor, and Timon, Parmenas, and Nicholas, 
a proselyte from Antioch. Did you notice who they chose? If you go back and you dig deeply into these seven men that they chose, these seven men that were chosen to care for the Greek-speaking widows were all, you ready? They were all Grecian. Is there wisdom in God's Word that shows us that when some situation arises, a solution is offered, the selection of those who should solve the problem should be those who are intimately familiar with what one goes through or what one is going through. One who has an understanding of what's going on. That is what I see in this passage. These seven men chose that the congregation chose seven men who were intimately familiar with how the Grecians were being neglected. Brethren, this shows to be wisdom on behalf of the early church. Instead of holding a grudge, make sure you get this, instead of holding a grudge against those who started the dispute, the early Christians sought to get rid of the dispute and they appointed men from the group that grumbled against what the problem was. You're grumbling about it. Don't just grumble. Come and offer a solution. Use your wisdom. How would you approach the situation. I'm sad to report that I don't think that there are many individuals in our world and in our culture today who have the wisdom to do what the Scripture says. Because we hold too many grudges. Because we aren't willing to be forgiving as God's Word commands us to be. Mike and I we have, and I'll use Mike now, Chip. I'll move off of you. I'll, I'll pick on Mike. Mike and I have a difference of opinion on how we ought to solve a problem. Let me ask the question. Whose way is right? In Mike's mind, did you hear him? Did you hear what he said? Very quickly, Mike said, mine. But if you were to ask me, and Mike says, what's the solution on the sex my way? But the answer is probably somewhere in the middle of Mike's opinion and my opinion. And we can dig to find the common answer for whatever it is. We can find it right here. Amen. God has not given us any problem that cannot be solved by looking into his word. Because if I remember correctly, and someone can help me out, the scripture says that God has given us all things that pertain to life and godliness. The Bible contains the answer to every problem in the world as it exists, and it gives us the answer to every problem that can and will exist in the church. That's what God's Word is capable of. These seven men they were willing to look past the fact that their own had been neglected and that they wanted to be part of the solution, not part of the problem. The fact that the church chose these Greek-speaking men to oversee the daily distribution that was to go to the Grecian widow demonstrates to me they appointed the most qualified men. The church appointed men who knew the language and they knew the people who they would be serving. So the church sets before the apostles these seven men. Keep reading verse 6. Whom they set before the apostles. And when they, the apostles, had prayed had prayed 
They laid hands on them. Well, wait a minute, Brother Ray. You already said that the apostles probably had laid hands on those men. Very possible. Why then would they need to lay hands on them a second time? I believe the second time that they laid hands on them was to ensure that they would have the wisdom they needed to solve the problem. But that's not the important part. The laying on of hands is the secondary part here. The very first thing the apostles did when those men were put forth by the congregation is they Why would it be wonderful if we had the words of the prayer that they offered on behalf of these men? Kelly, would that give us a little bit more insight about what the expectation was? But it doesn't give it to us, brethren. It leaves us to use our own intensive research to know that what they prayed was for the best of the people. That's what's important. You and I need to understand that the apostles in their prayer, they were showing their dedication to what they had said in the previous verses that we should not serve tables, but that we should walk, preach, and pray. They understood what their priority was. They exhibited that priority before the congregation and before these seven men. They said, we're going to pray for them. I believe they prayed that these men may continue to be of a good reputation. I believe they continued to pray that they would be full of the Holy Spirit and that they would allow the Holy Spirit to be the guide in the work that they were going to accomplish. I also believe that they prayed that they might have a deeper wisdom as it applied to this problem. So you have a situation, a solution, and then you have a selection. Based on those three things, as you close out this chapter in verse number 7, notice what happened. The same thing happened in this passage when the apostles used their wisdom. The same thing happened here that happened in Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 3, Acts chapter 4, and Acts chapter 5. There was a spread of the gospel. You might be thinking in your mind, what do you mean? I suggest to you, as I look at verse 7, where it says, And the word of God spread, and the number of the disciples multiplied greatly in Jerusalem, and a great many of the priests were obedient to the faith. The word of God increased. You and I should not be surprised that the word increased. And notice the simple that says that it increased greatly in Jerusalem. Let me ask you a question. We go back to Acts chapter 2 and we know that it's recorded for us that we're 16 nations listed. And we know that some of those 16 nations stayed behind in Jerusalem as illustrated by Acts chapter 6. After those on the day of Pentecost saw the power of the Holy Spirit and what the apostles were able to accomplish by teaching God's Word, we read that there were, what, some 3,000 added to the Lord's church by the Lord. But the verse goes on and says that the Lord added daily those who were being saved. I suggest to you that the Word of God increased because the people that were there the people that saw those who were obedient to the gospel, it increased because those individuals lived the faith that they were supposed to be living. And so we see this increase taking place. So it should come as no surprise that after this particular incident takes place, that the word of God continues to grow. 
and to multiply. I suggest to you that the reason the word increase is because those who saw what took place, they saw how God's plan, not man's plan, worked. They saw that these men were appointed to take care of a problem and I'm sure that they saw how that situation was resolved. And as they saw it being resolved by God's word, they themselves wanted to become a part of the church. So here it is, the apostles being freed from waiting on tables waiting free from caring about the benevolent needs of the church. They were free and able to focus on prayer and preaching. God realized in His wisdom that the apostles needed to pray and to preach and that the others would serve the table so that the word could be confirmed, the word that was being preached could be confirmed by those who were carrying out the word. You see, the number of disciples, as we said, multiplied greatly in Jerusalem. And what's interesting to me in that verse is the last part. Notice it says, notice it says, and a great many of the priests of the priests who were weak who were the priests supposed to serve what role did the priests serve and why is it mentioned here the priests that are mentioned here were those who were still serving in the temple under the old in other words, through the actions that these priests saw, through what they heard, they saw that the old law was now of no effect and that the new law had come into existence. They had this understanding of the old law, which remember, the old law, what was it? It was a law that pointed where? It pointed to the coming of Jesus the Christ, the Messiah, the one who was going to come to give his life a ransom for many so that God could be patient, that God would wait for all to come to repentance so that no one would be lost. The priests now understood because they saw this in action they understood that the one who was prophesied had indeed come. And that he had indeed walked on the face of the earth as you and I do just as they did, only to go through his life with no spot, no guile, no blemish. They realized that that man, Jesus, the one prophesied of in the Old Testament, that he was the perfect sacrifice, the perfect sacrificial lamb for their sin and for our sin. They realized that he went to the cruel cross and that he gave his life. We gathered around the Lord's table to remember his death, did we not? They understood that his body, the flesh was torn. They saw and they knew that the blood had flowed forth. Before the crucifixion, when he was scourged and when the crown of thorns was placed upon his head. Brethren, the shedding of blood began even before Jesus was hung on the cross. They know that his, 
hands were nail, were nail pierced, and that his feet were nail pierced. They knew and they saw that his side had been pierced with the sword, and both blood and water flowed forth. They understood because they themselves, in my opinion, get me. You know what? You know what it means when I say in my opinion, right? You can take it or leave it. But I pray that I'm telling you the truth this morning. They had seen and witnessed what Christ went through. They were part of the multitude who cried forth, crucify him, crucify him. Amen. They knew. Now they gained a better understanding. Why? Because of the actions of the apostles and the action of these seven. You see, the increase in the disciples and the conversion of the priests is directly attributed to the appointment of demons set. You can say, as we close this, you can say in your mind, this is an example of demons being appointed. I will agree with you on that. This is a good example of appointing leaders in the church. I agree with that. But the important lesson is really in my mind is not that. The important lesson is to see those who have been discriminated against being brought into equality with everyone. Remember, brethren, to God there is no crayon. There are not 64 magical colors in God's sight. There is one color. There is one color. I cannot emphasize that enough. The one color is the color of a soul. It's the color of a soul. Because the scripture teaches us what is man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? The Bible never defines the color of the soul. It says that your soul, my soul, no matter what the difference in the pigmentation of our skin is, is valuable in the sight of the God who in the beginning created the heavens and the earth. I don't know any other way to put it. I wish our world today would learn that lesson. I wish our leaders would hit, quit pitting this group against that group and treat us all as Americans. It's hard, brethren, sometimes. It's hard to stand before you and pray that I don't offend anyone. Because you all know I would never want to offend one of you. I would never want to offend one who is in need of salvation. Because I want to be like God wants me to be. And I pray that you will be who God wants you to be. And that is to be colorblind. Because that's the only way that we're going to go out and we're going to save a world that is lost and a world that is dying. And so as I close this morning, what we need to see is one of the very basic needs of people. People want to be cared about. And people want to be cared for. The question is, how do you, how do I care for you? This morning we may have one in our midst who's not a member of the body of Christ. And through faith in His Word and the willingness to Put your faith in action. 
you will be one who will repent. Leave the way that the world wants you to live. Leave the grips of Satan and come and live in the way of God. Where his arms are open to you like a loving father in the story of the fathers. Waiting for you to come to him and to confess his son as the one who gave his life for you. And be immersed with him in the water of baptism where you contact the blood and your sin can be washed away. This morning, if you have done that, and you've allowed this old world, I got to quit saying it that way. If you've allowed Satan and his army to deceive you again and draw you back, you need to come home. You need to make acknowledgement, repent of those sins. Make confession of those sins that are of a public nature before this assembly. Those of a private nature, I pray that you will take care between you and God before it's everlasting to them. This morning, if you need to come home, if you need to leave the way of the world and you begin to live the way of God, we're here for you. We don't, we're, we're just like God. We don't want anyone to be lost. We want everyone to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ. But most of all, we want you to know that we care for you. And because we care for you, we want to help you get to heaven. And we can begin to help you if you will let us pray with you and pray for you. That's what God wants us to do, to use the same wisdom that the apostles used in spreading the gospel and being mindful of each other in our daily prayers. This morning, you know your need. I pray you come on this morning.